Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of the Poker News Podcast. I am your girl, Sarah Herring, joined by Chad Holloway. Now, Chad and I have spent a large majority of our adult lives traveling the poker circuit, of which, particularly post-Black Friday, almost all of it was on the European Poker Tour, for me at least, specifically. And this is the very first ever European Poker Tour online. We are all obviously dealing with a new situation here in 2020, but in honor of the tradition of the European Poker Tour, we decided to do a special episode dedicated to the EPT. Chad, I guess you've, would you say the EPT is where you spent the majority of your travel life? Yeah, I mean, especially from my first stint with Poker News back in 2010 to 2016, it was a lot of EPT travel and I loved it. Like the EPTs uh, were fantastic, are fantastic. You know, we haven't had any here this year aside from the EPT Sochi, which I unfortunately couldn't attend, which is why I'm pretty excited about this EPT online. Because even though I'm based in the United States, getting a little taste and a little flavor of what it was all like. Um, Sarah, you and I have had many good memories at a lot of EPT stops. I remember um, going for a nice little tandem bike ride with you at EPT San Remo down the Italian Riviera. Um, that's one that certainly sticks out in my mind. I actually would have forgot about that. I do remember <laughs> that also. You know, it's funny because in the more recent years, we, um, you know, I think had a little bit less time. As the video team, we used to have a day before the tournaments would start where we would do a video about things poker players could and should see when they had time apart or time off the felt rather. Um, but it's interesting because even actually uh, we, we will get into quite a few interviews this episode, but when I spoke to Kevin McPhee, he mentioned something kind of similar, which is that things shifted, things changed a little bit. And one of the things that changed was that they created these schedules with just sick, crazy value all over the place. So basically poker players started just busting, regging, busting, regging, playing, 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 playing. And I think in the last few years doing slightly less exploring of, of the cities. And actually we also ended up doing slightly less because we had kind of already done most of the things in those cities. But Chad, you were one of the few bloggers who really made a point to show up early, to stay late, to do the things to really see the cities that we were in. And so you really, I think you're one of the people that I really enjoyed traveling around with, checking things out with. And one of the questions I've asked a lot of the guys was to talk a little bit about some of those stops that really stand out, not for the poker necessarily, but for the adventure. Yeah. I mean, I always made it a point to, like you said, take in where I was going. And this is because I'm getting paid to go there. I'm going to be working long hours. I might not never go <clears throat> back there again. So I got to make the most of it. And that means, you know, going a day early, sacrificing a little sleep. I was always willing to do that. Usually it was uh, a good opportunity to get there early because then I could tag along with you and the video crew. Cause you guys would always have uh, these photo shoots lined up. I remember um, in Malta, Malta is certainly one that sticks out in my mind because it was a new stop. Uh, the first time we went there and, um, we went to, I, I tagged along with you guys, you and uh, I think Will was the cameraman at the time. And uh, we went to that Popeye village where they had filmed the Robin Williams Popeye movie way back in the day. And so they had this, uh, this village was still standing. Uh, the history at a lot of these European poker tour stops was just immense. I remember when they uh, were in um, Austria for, it was like a, a very special um trip to Austria. They had been there before. They hadn't been there for a while. I said, I want to be on that one. Went there and, you know, did a tour of the city and it's just very, very historic. And then of course, back to Malta, Sarah, one of the most popular videos ever on poker news was a woman getting eaten alive by a thousand fish because I had found this one little spa just around the corner from the casino where they had, uh, you know, one of those fish spas where you could put your feet in this this uh, tank of fish and they would go and nibble on your feet. And if you haven't seen that, uh, by all means, check it out. Sarah's reaction when she puts her feet into the tank uh, was certainly priceless. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot about that. That's so funny. That's so funny. And I remember when we went to go do this, I remember 
specifically thinking no one is ever going to watch this video. Like this is such a scam to just get out of the casino for a couple hours. And it is one of the highest hitting videos ever on poker news. So good job, Chad Holloway on that one for sure. Um, you know, it's, in my reflecting in the last couple of days on my experience of the EPT, it's like a lot of other things I think for me in life where you sort of don't realize what you have until it's gone. And, and I mean that not necessarily in the sense that the EPT is gone because it certainly isn't. And I'm sure it will come back again, I hope. Um, but it, when I very first started at Poker News, there was a interesting sort of partnership between poker stars and poker news where we actually were creating the video content for both sites for their web shows so most of the stops we were traveling with multiple teams so it would be me and lynn gilmartin me and christy arnett christy and lynn together and this was also the time when we had the ept the lapt the appts the there was a lot of the napt so there was just like constant traveling going on um and we all were around each other all the time. And it was interesting because once this sort of, it was a gradual shift away from that and a gradual shift to less and less tour stops. And I think if you would have asked me during the time, I just would have been like, oh, it's exhausting. We're traveling all the time. And I actually had times where I wished I wasn't traveling with everyone else. Cause I was like, you know, I'd really like to just get on the plane and like read a book and not feel like I have to talk to everybody. And, da -da. and in hindsight, I'm like, it was so amazing <laughs> to be with our best friends and to be traveling with our best friends and to be exploring all of these places fresh and new together. And I definitely, you know, in retrospect, I just realized, wow, that was a time that was so precious and so sort of magic that really did kind of die out and gave birth to something, you know, different, which I think is, has also been very cool and interesting. Was it the same for you guys in the, in the blog realm where you went from a much larger team to a much smaller team? Yeah, it definitely was. You know, there were so many events taking place that you needed a large team. Like you mentioned, you had it on the video front, we had it on the blogging front, and then they had made it so maybe we're not covering as many events as we did in the past, just some of the highlight events or what have you. And so, you know, we were certainly on the, the smaller side of things. And I, I know exactly what you're saying, Sarah. There was little moments on the EPT that at the time certainly didn't resonate as much as they do now. And one of them is like every day, getting up for breakfast in whatever hotel we might have been at in whatever city and just having that 20 minutes of a team before the madness of the day started and uh, you know it was always fun to just catch up to say hi and that's really where we shared like personal stories and and things like that and so you know just just the EPTs hold a very big place in my heart for all sorts of reasons you know I got to see a lot of cool places I got to do a lot of cool things and uh, I got to spend a lot of quality time with people who are still lifelong friends you know you and I are still here at poker news we we've been here a long time but there's others who have moved on but we still always have kind of have the, the EPTs to to uh, look back on and then of course there's always the pride of the EPT media events, right? When, when they would find that little sliver of a couple hours, one day during each festival where they would hold a media event for us. Uh, sometimes it was free for prizes. Other times we might have to put in 20 euros or something like that. But it was a lot of drinks involved, a lot of fun involved. And then of course, a lot of pride involved. I've got my Italian flag on Hand and Mob because at that time they would report these small little tournaments to, to Hand and Mob. And so I certainly remember a lot of memories like that. It's so funny. I was going to mention the media tournaments too, because I, it was just such, such bragging rights, but also, you know, that was such an act of service for the dealers and for this, the staff, the staff really to put together this tournament for us. It certainly was not something that they needed to do or were required to do. And I always really appreciated it. And you know, as we get farther into the show, you know, we've talked to several poker players. We talked to some of the staff and people behind the scenes to get some of their memories and their reflections. And it's interesting because to me so far, it feels like the common thread is that the people on this tour were really the heart and the, the core of what made this 
tour so special and what continues I'm sure to make it so special and even though some people have transitioned in and out and and back and forth there really is this core group of people that um I actually was thinking a little bit more about it last night I was trying to think when I very first started who were these people that I would expect to see at every stop. And I was trying to think about the players because we talk, I talk a lot later, you know, about all these, uh, the staff, I think that really made the, the framework, the skeleton, if you will, of, of what this whole thing was. And I was thinking, I guess it really did. A lot of it did shift because I remember when I very first started, it was always like, there was this little core group of Brits. It was like, David Van Plew and Rupert Elder and J.P. Kelly, Toby Lewis. There was this group that you I would always see, you know, standing outside the doors of all these little tiny conference rooms. And I was also trying to think of who were the players that were always really accessible. And one of the things I remembered was that poker stars used to have a huge roster of Team Poker Stars pros. Huge. When I first started every event, they were sending you know, 10 players or something, 15 players to, to the stops. And that's also an interesting, you know, sort of shift that, that we've seen. And well, you know, Sarah, like I I dug out some props here for, so if you're watching the video version of this, you'll see some props. If you're listening to this in the podcast version, you'll have to just listen to me describe it. But you know, now there's so few ambassadors. One of them is this guy, Mr. Chris Moneymaker. I dug out his headshot from some EPT that uh, they had there to pass out. Um, looking good here, Mr. Chris. Uh, I got a couple other things. This is one of the other things I liked about the EPT, Sarah, is they did so many little details. So like whenever you'd go to a stop, they'd usually have like a little pamphlet book. Uh, Right now, this one is for EPT Prague. And in it, they'll have the schedule, they'll have the history of the event, even structures and things like that. Uh, They would have, you know, just little flyer advertisements, whether it was for the player party, including some pictures of, of things to do and, uh, players who might have made a big uh, impact at that particular stop. Uh, Of course, who can forget the all in triangle button that would always be on the EPT broadcasts, you know, toss that little sucker out there whenever a player was all in, got the EPT poker stars dealer button that I um, picked up somewhere along the lines. And then of course, you know, I've got my PS live card for those few EPT events, side events that I was able to work into a a schedule but uh yeah i don't know good memories all around from playing the like i said a few ept things the media events to working it and um yeah that's why i wanted to be part of this special podcast sarah because the ept online well if it's online we're not at a special destination you know we're not in doville we're not in barcelona we're not in london it still has a pretty good feel as we're recording this we're already three days into the ept online series it's going to continue for about another week or so and I've been enjoying, we're doing the updates on Poker News, so I'm really enjoying watching those. And there's always been, already been some winners crowned, so I've certainly been enjoying seeing some of these players winning it and winning it from, you know, countries throughout Europe, even around the world, which is, which is exciting. And um, as you mentioned, Sarah, we've got a pretty good show here. I spoke with, well, you know him as the World Series of Poker main event champion from 2019, Hossein Ensan. But some of us, before he won the big one, knew him from the EPT. You know, he lived in Germany. He would travel to all these stops. He made several final tables, I think three, before he finally broke through and won the EPT Prague main event back in 2015. And so I thought, who better to have as a guest on this special episode than an EPT champion who also happens to be a WSOP champion and uh, is one of the biggest poker names in the world right now. And he'll talk a lot about what we've already talked about, what he loved about the EPT, what kept him going back, will keep him going back because he's very anxious to have some more live stops. Uh, I can tell you that. All right. I am with my guest, someone I'm very excited to speak to, the 2019 World Series of Poker main event champion. He's also an EPT champion, one at Mr. Hossein Ensan. Hossein, how are you doing? Uh, hi, I'm fine. Thank you, Chad. I'm doing well. Good. It's uh, It's been a crazy year, you know, 2020 with the pandemic. What's life been like for you? Uh, 2020, it was a crazy, crazy year uh, for coronavirus. 
And uh, all in all, it was a very nice year for sure for me after the uh, bosses of poker champion. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Good. Uh, I'm happy to hear that. Have you been playing any poker, you know, in 2020? Any online poker, maybe? In 2020, from beginning, um, I was uh, underway in King's Casino and uh, Party Poker Nottingham. And in Cyprus, uh, as you know, uh, in Europe, uh, um, coronavirus uh, pandemic beginning end of February. And uh, uh, since this time, I didn't play live and uh, online uh, I tried uh, to play online a bit on the party poker and uh, only uh, a couple of section, not too much. Gotcha. Uh, the EPT online is happening on Poker Stars. And, you know, even before you won the World Series of Poker main event, a lot of yeah. us who traveled to the EPTs, we knew you from there. You, you were a, you know, one of those guys who was playing all sorts of EPTs. You actually won the EPT Prague back in 2015. And what was it like to, to win the EPT title back then? Um, um, before, before, and, uh, before to World Series of Poker, I was uh, uh, often uh, under a PT uh, overall in Europe and uh, so uh, what was your question again please? Sure well you you played the EPT for a long time for many years yes. and then you finally got your big win in Prague what was it like yes. to to finally get that EPT win? Uh, um, I started with EPT uh, since uh, 2010, I think, and uh, my first uh, success, it was in, in Barcelona, and uh, so I had a very good run, uh, 2014 and 15, and uh, in Prague uh, I won uh, this one, and uh, so all my experience, uh, it was through EPT, for sure. And, uh, you know, what is it that you like about the EPT? Uh, what, what kept you going to all the different stops? What, what did you like most about the EPT? Uh, EPT, uh, from the name, is a European Poker Tour. So, and uh, from my home to next stop is, uh, with uh, airplane, is uh, only two hours. And with car, uh, the, the next one is uh, 700 kilometer. And uh, uh, I learned my, my poker through EPT, uh, uh, TV, I learned a, a lot. And uh, I'm EPT, I, I go to EPT because I meet uh, a lot of friends, German friends. I'm uh, original from Iran and uh, Iranian player also. And uh, uh, by the APT is a, is a, uh, um, a lot of uh, good player. That's why I play against a uh, good player. That's why. What uh, I got to ask you, what's your favorite EPT stop that you've been to? I know I, I like Prague where you won your title. I've always been a big fan of going to Prague. Uh, what are some, what's your favorite stop or some of your favorite stops? So all APTs is, uh, is, is, uh, are very nice. APT Barcelona uh, for sure is beautiful city. And uh, my favorite stop is for sure Prague. I want this one already. And uh, I like Prague. Prague is a beautiful city. And uh, I meet uh, always uh, a lot of uh, good uh, poker friends. <clears throat> and uh, the city is beautiful. And uh, as you know, I won this one. Mm -hmm. That's why it, for me is a favorite uh, stop is Prague. Okay. Sure. And Barcelona also. 
if you could choose for the EPT to go anywhere in Europe, uh, a city that they are a country that they've never been to before, where would you like to see the EPT go in the future? In the future, uh, uh, Open Need uh, is uh, the, with, with coronavirus, uh, uh, the, the time is uh, true. I think as a as the next EPT in Sochi, I saw uh, yesterday or two two, year, two days ago, his next EPT live is uh, in Sochi, in uh, Russian, and uh, I tried I tried to go. I miss live poker, <laughs> and I think uh, uh, if uh, everything is uh, uh, coming to normal life, I go to live poker. I miss live poker. Right. As, uh, yes. I know this summer there was no World Series of Poker in Vegas. You know, they had World Series of Poker online, but that wasn't the same. Were you sad that you didn't get to go to Las Vegas and, and defend your main event title? Uh, I, want, I want to go to Vegas to defend my title for sure. But uh, uh, through uh, coronavirus and pandemic, uh, it was not possible. And uh, it was uh, online GG poker, World Series of Poker. Uh, online poker is not my, my game. That's why I didn't play this one. Uh, I like uh, live poker face to face. And uh, I tried to 2021 20, to go to Vegas and defend my title for sure. Well, we certainly look forward to seeing that hopefully in 2021. And Hossein, I wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us at Poker News. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for, for inviting Pro. He's just such a lovely, warm person with just such a really vibrant, positive energy. And I feel that it makes sense at this spot in the show as we are talking about the German world champion that we would move into Kevin McPhee. So for those who don't know, Kevin McPhee did win EPT Berlin and it was a very specific, interesting event in that it was one of the very first times where there was a six figure guarantee for the winner. It attracted a ton of players. It was very highly publicized and it was also the year that Bitcoin was sort of founded. So there's also lots of players who were there around that time who have done very well financially um, in the Bitcoin space, but that's neither here nor there, but it became most notorious for being the first, I think, and potentially only ever time that an EPT was robbed. And Kevin tells us that story and how he made his way to EPT victory still. So let's just find out what EPT Berlin was like for Kevin McPhee. Hello, everybody. I am joined by Kevin McPhee, a face that I'm sure you will all know and recognize whom I feel like actually we have not caught up in like a really long time. I was just scrolling yesterday through your Twitter, kind of trying to see what's going on. I do remember noticing a while back, actually, that you were leaving Vegas. You were like getting rid of all your stuff, sort of like a mass exodus, I think, to Canada. But for those who are listening, first, just kind of like catch us, catch us up. You're not a Las Vegan anymore. You're not a Coeur d'Alene-er. You're still always sort of be a Coeur d'Alene-er, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, Idaho is my still considered my home for me. Uh, but yeah, I, I moved more permanently to Vegas. I stopped traveling for a couple of years and started working there. I really wasn't playing poker as much. I'm still playing some tournaments from time to time, but not the crazy grind that I did for 10 years. You know, I was pretty much traveling the European poker tour circuit for nonstop for, for about 10 years there. So it was quite a change of pace. But yeah, I mean, I'm in Canada now. I moved out of Vegas. Uh, I'm a Canadian citizen, so I figured this was a pretty good time to exercise my right to go to Canada. And uh, it's much less, much less COVID up here and more online poker options, so it just seemed to make a lot of sense. Plus, I can ski, so looking forward to that. 
There's so many things I'm uh, on board with in your life. One, I'm a Colorado girl, so I feel like this uh, skiing thing I'm on board with. Also, when I was looking at my dream lives of where I wanted to live, uh, Idaho was like top three states I was very interested in living in. But I did not know that you also have Canadian citizenship. Is this, how did you manage that? I actually got my passport the day Donald Trump was elected president. Um, it just kind of worked out that way. I, I had applied beforehand and I just was happening, happened to going, going to the embassy that day. And yeah, I got my, my passport the day he became president. So my, my dad was born up in Vancouver. So I always technically, I guess, was a Canadian citizenship or Canadian citizen. I just didn't have proof of it. Uh, but my grandfather was a professor at University of British Columbia and served in the military. So, uh, yeah, I, I figured it was a good idea to multiply passports. You never really know what's going to happen. Obviously, knowing what we know now with 2020, it was a very good idea. Uh, I was also dating a girl in Canada for a while, so I wanted to make sure that I could stay and live there and not have any issues. So that was the major motivation for it. It's so funny. I have so many close friends in the poker industry who have struggled with this. You know, it's like you sp spoke about and like we will talk more about being on this circuit that we all traveled on. You have this close crew of people, but most of whom are from totally different places in the world. And I know so many people in relationships who struggle with just being able to be together, to spend time together, to meet up with each other. Even Lynn Gil Martin and Hell had, I mean, they got married. I think they love each other and wanted to get married probably anyways, but it was a big issue in terms of him getting into Australia. It was like, if they didn't get married, they weren't going to be able probably to pursue, especially in these COVID times, you know, a, a relationship. And, you know, when I was looking back on your win in Berlin, which was sort of unprecedented in a lot of ways, the first time there was a million dollars guaranteed, uh, Berlin had its own series of, of crazy things that went down. But I also, I noticed it was just before, right before Black Friday, right? 2010? Was it 2011? It was uh, very close to Black Friday. Yeah, I mean, it was 2010 that I won the tournament. And then Black Friday, obviously, was April 11th, uh, 2011. So I was in England at the time, literally playing online. And then I was registering tournaments as I was playing. And then all of a sudden I couldn't register anymore. So uh, it was quite a shock, but you know, I was pretty set up to deal with it a lot better than a lot of American pros. I mean, I was already traveling internationally. Um, I, you know, I got into that from 2008. So, and I was able to relocate pretty quickly. So I got everything set up in Canada. I had a buddy that, that got me set up up there so I could uh, redo my accounts and, and uh, get back up playing online. But, you know, for a lot of American pros, they had to move out of the country for the first time, go travel for the first time ever. And a bunch of them, you know, moved to either Costa Rica or Mexico or to Canada. And I already kind of had a lot of friends up here anyway. So it really wasn't that big of an issue for me. It just took like a little bit of time to get the documentation to make sure to get my accounts back, you know. It's interesting because that's what I, w I was wondering. I feel like after Black Friday, there was sort of a crew of people on this circuit, the EPT circuit specifically, who uh, maybe would not have been playing as much live poker if it hadn't been for Black Friday. But you and, an, and a small group of other people, it seems like we're already sort of traveling the circuit. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it because it's... Um, as you've mentioned, and uh, I was just talking to Kristen Bicknell last week, and she was saying just COVID has been really a relief for her in some ways, because it's really a grind to constantly travel the circuit. But when you're in it, you just feel like you've got to go to the next thing. And this is what your friends are doing. This is like, what's the next restaurant we're going to or whatever. So talk to me a little bit about just that lifestyle choosing that lifestyle is there really an age where it kind of feels like I think there was probably an age where it seemed a lot easier and made a lot more sense but um yeah talk to me about choosing to kind of you know be transient and follow a live tournament circuit well I mean it wasn't something I really had planned on um I kind of fell into it a little bit accidentally I was living with Dylan Lindy and, and Carter Gill in Idaho and we basically just had a an apartment set up or a house I guess it was basically like a poker colony. It was just all of our living room was computers lined up with the, next to each other. And we just grinded poker nonstop for like a full year. 
And, you know, I'm just a kid from Idaho. I hadn't really traveled anywhere or been anywhere. So Carter had won a seat to go play a tournament in Sydney. And we followed on the blogs and everything. And, and I mean, he just won it from the comfort of our own living room. And it, it seemed pretty attractive, you know, like you can win uh, your seat, your hotel, your airfare to a big international tournament just from playing in my living room in Idaho. And I hadn't been anywhere. So it was, it was super attractive to me. So I want to, uh, I kind of set my sights on trying to win a seat to something. Uh, and I think it was like May of 2008, I won a seat to the LAPT in Costa Rica. So that was my first tournament. And uh, we had, we were moving out of that house, planning on going to Vegas for the summer. And I drove down to, uh, with my car to Vegas and flew, flew to Costa Rica from there. And I put all my things in storage, kind of thinking, you know, I'll, I'll come back and I'll get a place. We'll just see how the summer goes, you know? And I, I absolutely loved Costa Rica. I made a lot of really good friends there. And, you know, you get pretty hooked on it pretty quickly. You know, I, I, for somebody I'd never really traveled anywhere. And now all of a sudden I'm going on tours through rainforests and, and hanging out with a bunch of people that are very like-minded uh, it was just, it was uh, just something I really wanted to get into. Um, at, at that time, I was done with college. Uh, I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have a job. I didn't really have, an, I didn't have a dog. You know, I didn't have anything to tie me to Idaho besides just my family. So I put my things in storage and just went to Vegas with these guys after the, the Costa Rica trip. And while I was there, I won a seat for APPT Macau in 2008. And then EPT Barcelona, which was the first EPT I traveled to. And, you know, I, I went on those trips and I kept extending my storage unit thinking someday I'd come back. And uh, I got pretty deep in the Macau tournament. I got down to like two tables and, you know, they just deposit the money right back into your PokerStars account. So I was able to, to keep playing more and more qualifiers for things. And then when I went to Barcelona, I cashed my first EPT I played and it was a it was an 8,000 buy-in back then. So it was a pretty big min cash for somebody who was coming up grinding $11 and $22 tournaments <laughs> and such. So uh, when I, when I went on that first Barcelona trip, I really just fell in love with Europe. I'd never been there before. I mean, everybody was super friendly. Poker was uh, in its very inception back then, like the European poker tour had been going for a bit, but you know, you, you didn't have all the super strong elite players from all these European countries competing back then. So the play was super weak. And I was just like, man, this is, this is just amazing. Um, so I really made it my mission that season. It was season five of the EPT to try to qualify for every single European poker tour that year, uh, which I did. So uh, I went from Barcelona. I had won a seat to uh, go play World Series of Poker Europe in London. I went and played that. I made a bunch of friends. And then sort of in between European poker tour trips, I would go to Amsterdam, grind, chill and you know win my win my seat into the next thing so i was able to qualify for every european poker tour that year and yeah it was a, it was a lot of fun and I, I just kept extending that storage unit i ended up extending that storage unit for about eight years <laughs> wow, that's crazy so. that's so crazy and that's i mean honestly that's such an accomplishment though too to qualify for every tournament it's that's bananas but my grandpa used to own uh some storage units and he has always told me it's the best business model in the world because no one ever comes and gets their stuff they just pay and pay i'm like okay duly noted in the future that will be uh my next investment but you okay so you of course traveled tons of the stops tons of the the circuits and the you know, I, I, I do miss the LAPT, by the way. I miss the NAPT. I miss them all. I just miss more live poker with, for obvious reasons. But your the stop that you won, I think, will probably go down in EPT history as, like, the craziest thing that ever happened at an EPT event. Um, can you tell me what your experience of the Berlin robbery was? Uh, well, yeah, obviously it was a unprecedented event, you know, I mean, there really wasn't anything like that that had ever happened before. Um, we were, they were holding the tournament in the Grand Hyatt instead of Spielbank Berlin. So they maybe didn't have the security that they hoped to have, have had. So they were literally just registering people for the high roller tournament that day, 10,000 euros a pop cash, you know, like right in the convention center. And they had pretty minimal security. So I think... What ended up happening is one of the guys who orchestrated the robbery was playing in the tournaments, realized that they had lax security 
and sort of told his buddies about it. And they, they came in with masks and machetes and robbed the registration desk. So the registration desk was right in front of the convention center where there was a women's tournament going on. And uh, there was the high roller beginning and a couple like low turbos and stuff like that. And I was, we were down to three tables at that point. I think there was like about 20 people left in the tournament out of 940. So we were all kind of congregated around the TV stage. Like we had the TV table, which I was on, and then two outside tables that were put both part of the tournament. So we couldn't see what was going on. We just started hearing a commotion. We heard people kind of screaming. I think at one point somebody said, uh, they have a bomb or they have a gun or something. I believe it was they had a bomb. And I mean, I'm American. So when somebody started, when I hear that commotion and I see everybody screaming, I'm thinking somebody's got a gun. So I got up out of my chair. I got low to the ground and against the wall. And uh, some of the Russian guys even gave me some crap about it later. Um, <laughs> kind of, you know, saying that I was like a little sissy or whatever. But I mean, honestly, I'd rather just protect myself. Um, but yeah, there was a huge rush of people. In fact, the TV stage I was on collapsed and the feed cut to black. So you can just imagine my parents who are waking up at 4 a.m. to watch the tournament in the States are railing and then all of a sudden they see everybody screaming and running and then it just cuts to black and they don't know what's going on. And uh, Michelle Orp was the EPT commentator back then. And I believe she got hurt in the stampede. Like somebody, she fell and somebody like hurt her arm or something like that. And you know, it was a real sort of panic in the room. Like there, there was a, a picture, and I, I don't know if I could find it still, but there's a picture of somebody that had a footprint in the middle of a flop because they had got up out of their chair and like ran across the table because there was such a rush of people. And there was just like a footprint in a flop, which was pretty, pretty nuts. And we had, we had hands in progress, you know? So on one of the outside tables, there was an all in, uh, that was on the turn it was like ace queen versus ace 10 and they were about to deal the river card and then everything like all hell broke loose right and the dealer fred uh fred barstos who's a uh, american who's actually living in in vienna one of the best dealers in the world he was dealing that table and had the wherewithal to place a single chip on top of the deck to preserve the game state and we had no idea what was going on. You know, we, we were told to leave out the, the service entrance where they're bringing our drinks in. And I'm a pretty big guy. So I just made sure nobody was rushing and that nobody was getting stamped, trampled or anything like that. There was no stampede. And we went out the service exit. And when we went out to the street. It was like ambulances, fire engines, police cars. And we had no idea what was going on. So uh, I just went back to my hotel with a with a actually a random American kid on the street who was just super freaked out. He just knew who I was and asked if he could go wherever I was going. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to my hotel and figure out what's going on. And we found out that it had been robbed and we were asked to come back five hours later and finish the tournament the same day, which I, I thought was quite strange, but uh, obviously it worked out for me. But yeah, it was certainly unprecedented. We had one table with chips knocked all over the table. So we had to reconstruct stacks. We had hands in progress. And Thomas Kremser, the, the tournament director at the time said, you know, we don't, we don't know how to handle the situation because it's never happened before. Um, we think that the, the, the game state has been preserved. I mean, we have the, the chip on the deck, right? But uh, our ruling is gonna be just to cancel this hand unless both players agree. So Alari Takakalio, who got runner up to me, he was the all in with the ace 10 and he was against a short stacks ace queen. And, you know, he had everybody in the room, all eyes on him on whether or not he wanted to agree. Obviously the guy who was ahead wanted to agree to just run the river card. Um, and I, I mean, honestly, I don't know if I, what I would do in that position, but I think he did the right thing and he agreed to just deal the river cards. And, you know, he, he reward, he was rewarded by being able to chop it three handed with us and, and get second for a big payday but uh yeah it was certainly it was certainly strange and then the next morning i was uh cbs morning show i was on live on, uh, to the entire east coast of america i did interviews for bbc and cnn so i mean it was a it was a pretty big international story maybe not something so much the poker community talks about anymore but as far as mainstream media they'd certainly picked up on this and uh yeah it was 
it was certainly strange. <laughs> I can't even imagine because even when I was just reading back through the final table, it was some very good poker, actually. I mean, you were clearly playing with very other accomplished poker players who knew what was going on. But to imagine coming back after, I mean, all the adrenaline, fear, you know, just not probably feeling super safe in that spot anymore, just a million different things going on. And then to come back and, you know, players are always talking about, you know, trying to keep yourself grounded and, you know, trying to really stay in the moment. I cannot even imagine what it's like to try to play poker after something like that. I can't even. Yeah, well, I was actually one of the people that was being vocal about maybe suspending the tournament for a day, but they obviously had their schedules. And uh, at the time, my friend Jim Colopy, who was in the room with me, uh, supporting me, we kind of went around and polled all the players, like, do you guys really want to play right now? I mean, like, we, in my opinion, we really shouldn't have to unless there was a consensus that everybody wanted to play. And, and I, my in initial instinct was like, we shouldn't be playing this right now. Like all of the television crew went home because they didn't feel safe. The other tournaments were all canceled. So we came back to a skeleton crew to a big empty room and then had to play out the biggest moment of our poker careers, you know, where a million euros, which was an unprecedented prize pool at that time up top. So yeah, it was certainly very, very unique. Um, I, obviously I'm glad that we played it out. I think the consensus from a lot of the players was that they just wanted to finish the tournament but I have a really hard time thinking that it didn't affect the play of the other people still there. So, Also, um, can we just take a moment to appreciate this dealer? This is like the most professional dealer status in the world. Like, okay, there's a, maybe a robbery, potentially a bomb. I'm not sure, but like I needed to preserve game integrity. This is my responsibility. This is my job. Like this guy's amazing. amazing. Yeah, he, he is amazing. And, and I actually, I bonded with him earlier in the tournament because uh I had a pretty good chip stack and, and he was my dealer at the end of one of the days and I'd ordered a couple of beers and I told him, you know, I'm on cruise control right now, Fred. Like I'm, I'm only playing sets and aces. And then he gave me aces and I like, I like took out somebody right at the end of the day. And, and he was so sweet too. Like, honestly, when we started up the final table, he showed up when we were three handed, he sent me a beer with a little note on it that said for cruise control time. And I still have that note to this day. So Fred, Fred is just one of, not only is he one of the best dealers, I mean, technically the guy is just amazing. Just like a super nice guy and obviously very cool headed to keep his calm in that, that chaos, you know? So props to him. It's so funny because in thinking about looking back at the EPT and, you know, our experiences traveling and everything, when I was talking to Chad about it, so many of the people that I remember the most or that I felt sort of this familial bond with were, you know, dealers, some of them, or a lot of the people who worked behind the scenes. I think Gary Gates, I got very close with in the traveling and um, like a few people who like manage the pros maybe, or I, it's just interesting. It was funny to me because I think uh, when we were talking about who to bring on the show and who were these sort of iconic faces in the EPT really players are who people care about and who people see but for those of us who are really traveling the circuit there are so many faces that are super recognizable that you see at every single stop those are the faces I think that we think about and that we remember are there I mean that's that's the way I am too that honestly really, like stuck out to you that you were just like man these are like these are the people that deserve to have a lot of kudos I think on the on the circuit well, I mean, I think I think it when it comes down to the event organizers, I mean, they're at every stop. So James White, Kirsty Thompson, um, Neil Johnson, um, the massage girls, you see them at every stop and they they work just as hard, if not harder than the poker players. I mean, they're they're in there working their asses off all day. So Dana uh, and, and Lena Kadora, I mean, I just. And, and it is really a community. It's not just the players that you see from place to place. It's it's the dealers, the event staff, the media, the even the massage girls, you know, like you just see them all the time at the same places. So you end up becoming friends with everybody. So honestly, I was probably like better friends with a lot of the people that followed the tour, not just to play than I was the actual players. Cause the players, you know, they change a lot from time to time and you don't, you don't see them at every stop, but you would always see Neil Johnson. I would always see Kirstie Thompson, you know, and and to me that when I look back on those memories, like the, those, those people were just always there. So 
and and we had a lot of good times going out drinking with them going for dinners and stuff so uh it really it really was its own unique community and I hope we I hope we can get back to the days where we start traveling and stuff. Uh, obviously, the earlier days of the European Poker Tour is a lot different because you had um, you didn't have the big flagship events. And now you go to Barcelona, you have two thousand people for an event. But I was going to EPTs when it was like in Warsaw or in Budapest or in Greece, you know, and these really off the wall places, Tallinn, Estonia, and I mean, it, you you know, you know, you don't see everybody following the the tour to every stop like that but the event staff and and the dealers and and all the support around the tour you saw those people at every stop it's so funny that some of the stops you mentioned people are always asking me you know what's what was your favorite stop you know where is the favorite places that you've been and almost all of my very favorite places are places that were they did maybe once or twice and only in the very early years and then they sort of shifted to this model of doing mostly just a few really really big stops. What were some of your favorite, you know, places and, and stops outside of, you know, winning, of course, I'm sure that stands out, but just exciting places we went. Um, well, I mean, I, I always had a, a huge love for Barcelona and Prague. I know that those are flagship events, so that probably doesn't fit your criteria, but I've been to each of those cities probably at least a dozen times and I just love going back there. Um, as far as the places, that were kind of like one stops or two stops maybe campione italy was uh was quite quite spectacular uh we're on lake lugano and they had the party on a boat i believe that was pretty fun um san remo italy just for the food and they like the whole town was kind of centered around the casino so if you busted you could just walk to any restaurant and there'd be like 10 or 20 poker players in there and you could just join a table or whatever um, so I really liked uh, San Remo, Italy a lot. But honestly, of the places they only went a couple times, I think my favorite would probably be Tallinn, Estonia. I mean, Estonia was just, everybody there was beautiful. It was really cheap to go wherever you wanted. Um, the action was really good. And just I had like a lot of fun away from the tables there as well. So Estonia, I've even been back to Estonia. Teresa, who is the the former, uh, former floor person for the EPT, yeah. she runs the king of, kings of Tallinn in Estonia and she's uh, invited me up every year and I've made it a couple times so it's just like I, I find reasons to go back to Estonia and for anybody who hasn't been there it was it's just like super fun it's just like an amazing city so that that was probably um, that was probably my favorite place but with honorable mentions to anywhere in Italy for the food <laughs> so yeah. I have to agree too. I'm always trying to explain to people, you know, I think Prague used to be this really, I mean, I love Prague still, but it used to be really cheap and people from, you know, throughout different places in Europe would just go, you could go spend a weekend there for less than you could like drink probably on a Friday and like, you know, the pub in your local UK place. So they had all these stag parties and stuff. Well, now it's, you've just got to go a little bit further east. Now you go to Tallinn if you want. It's just so much more fun to be somewhere where you can just go crazy and eat and drink and not have to worry about spending a ton of money. But also the time that I went to Tallinn, Ronnie Kaiser won the event and he did uh -huh. it at like 4 p.m. Like it started at one or two and it was over at four. I, this is the best tournament ever. I was so excited. I was like, this, we're all <laughs> gonna go out. We went out. They have great vodka, by the way, in Tallinn for those who are into that. But it was, I totally agree. I, there's, those are definitely the, the memories that I think of the most fondly is just everybody getting the opportunity to be out together and drinking together and, and eating together and, you know, we do our, we do our work, we play the poker, we record the poker, but the, uh, the opportunity to go out and do all these fun things and all these stops is something I think we are super lucky to have experienced really. Yeah. Especially like back in the day when I first started traveling for the European poker tour, the starting stack was 10,000 instead of 30. You know, you, you were usually out on day one. They had very limited amount of side events, rarely if any high rollers. So you really got to, oh, sorry, you really got to, you really got to bond a lot more with the people that you were traveling with because you had a lot more downtime. Nowadays, you know, the, the schedule is so just dense with events that you don't really have that much free time. And when you do, it's usually, you know, you, you go with your smaller group and go for a dinner or go check out the sites or whatever there is to do in the city. 
but back then it was just like a free for all. It was like, you just had all the time in the world because you had your hotel booked for five days and you're usually only playing for one day. So you just had all the free time, but you know, it, it was all in a way a lot more fun back then. Um, it was, it was less serious. Uh, it was a lot more filled with amateurs and it was just more about the traveling than it was getting down and like grinding nonstop, which I certainly like, like, it's obviously nice. They added a bunch of side events. They have big prize pools, big turnouts for a lot of these events. But, uh, I do kind of, I do kind of miss those days where you just, you'd bust out and you're like, okay, what am I going to do for the next four days in this city? You know, some city I've never been in before Budapest, Warsaw, Copenhagen, uh, Deauville, France, like that was, that was always a challenge because we we're always there in the off season, but man, the food there was amazing. And, and I, I know a lot of people didn't love that tournament series, but that was one of my favorite places as well, just because like you get to eat French food in your free time and go check out all the amazing restaurants and the go. I mean, I went down to uh, the beaches of Normandy to, to see where my grandfather flew in, in D-Day and stuff like that too. So that was, that was pretty special, but, yeah, it was just so cool how many different places we could go back then. Now it's much more condensed. You know, you have Monaco, Berlin, Prague, you know, they, maybe they go to London every once in a while, but really it's it's pretty condensed to the, to the major stops. So it's, it's a lot different sort of vibe than it was back then. It's so true. And I think, you know, regulations have changed so much, obviously, both online and live. Things are just, it just feels like a little bit of a different space. And I too was someone who really enjoyed Deauville and went to, you know, Normandy. And that was, I, for me, that was one of the most powerful, you know, side trips or day trips or something I ever did on any EPT stop. It was just very uh, intense and, and sobering, but in a really cool way, I, I will always be really grateful for, for getting to see that. Um, okay, I have to go get my child, but before okay. I let you go, um, just for those who are listening, who, you know, if they want to follow you, find you, if they want to keep track of where you are in the world um, at any given moment, can you give them your, your deets? Uh, well, yeah, I'm just Kevin McPhee on Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm a Luxac on Instagram. And Usually I keep a pretty low profile, but I actually am doing some commentary coming up here next month with Maria Ho and Sam R- R- uh, Razavi for uh, Indian Poker online site uh, called Spartan Poker. So you can check out that and see me try to do commentary. <laughs> I'm sure I'll be fine at it, but uh, you have a great voice. Uh, not not as experienced as Maria in that in that field. So. Uh, I'll no be doing one is that. as experienced as Maria in any field, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, she's wonderful, isn't she? I'm a big fan. Yes, me <laughs> I'm too. I'm a big fan. Me too, but you do have a great voice. Uh, obviously, you know about poker, but you have a great voice, so I'll be looking forward to that. And I also, that was one of the things I was really hoping would be one of the uh, results of COVID, was that some of these, that we would get more online sites, that we would get more casinos behind online poker, that we would get... Indian casinos and other places to realize that this might be something we should be getting behind or putting our money behind. So I support, I'm all about it and follow Kevin McPhee. I'm a Luxac. You guys know I'm a Luxac. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. So as we spoke a little bit about with Kevin, you know, there were so many players on the EPT who really left their mark. There was also a lot of staff and people behind the scenes that maybe those at home didn't always get to see, but that really made the core family crew of the EPT. And Lee Jones was one of the people who has been deeply embedded in poker stars for a very long time and also has been really deeply embedded in the poker community for a long time. Um, He really made his way and made a career as one of the first people, I think, to be a sort of balance between being someone who was on the business side of things and was also a real poker player and someone who loved poker. And so I wanted to talk to him a little bit. He made a transition at some point in his career to working on the EPT and he, as always, did not disappoint. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I am with Lee Jones, who we've spoken to several times on the podcast. I'm certain most of you probably know who Lee is, but for those who don't, he has a 
very deeply entrenched history and career in the poker world, including being an author. He was one of the sort of, I think, founding bosses on Two Plus Two. We use the term bosses loosely. Um, he was the director of poker room at online poker room at poker stars for ages he was the director of poker communications he has been associated with so many different elements of the poker world i honestly don't know where we would be in this poker life without the man that is lee jones welcome back to the poker news pod thank you sarah it's it's just such a great thing to be back and chatting with you and i really appreciate the opportunity thank you so when we were, I was talking to Chad about, you know, we're doing this sort of the EPT is going to be, well, it is online right now. And we started talking about and thinking about our own experiences with the EPT. And we decided to sort of dedicate an, an episode of the podcast to the EPT really. And what that's, that circuit has meant to so many people. And when we were thinking about who are the faces that people would know and recognize, it's interesting because you really started your, you know, I think life and career in poker in the online part of the poker space, which is what I think most people who have like a business background, I guess, in poker have done. But you made a shift at some point into being much more um, connected to the live events and specifically being connected to the EPT. And so I wanted to talk to you first about making that decision, making the decision to move into this space that was seemingly super different than what you had been doing before and and what that felt like for you. Yeah, um, so actually what what's sort of interesting is, is that I had been involved in poker seriously since the mid 80s and I am older than I should probably admit. But I when I joined Poker Stars in 2003, it, of course it became a shift into the online world. Um, yeah, I went over to the EPT in 2007. Essentially, it was a way of uh, phasing back in to a return to the United States. Because, I mean, I guess we're going back into deep history now, right? I mean, this would have been 2008, like that, 2007, 2007 um, 2006. And the whole online world was getting pretty sketchy in the United States. And I had wanted to get back to the United States and I really couldn't do it from a high profile online job. And so Isai Scheinberg, may his name be spoken for a thousand generations, um, was kind enough to let me go back and uh, work on the EPT. So I could sort of phase back into, you know, get basically get out of the online spotlight. And then, so it was an opportunity to do that. With that said, I never realized how insanely much fun it was going to be. So I just started attending a few EPTs and I very quickly went, these guys are having just a stupid amount of fun. And I, I sort of crafted a job for myself, um, acting as a, I'll call it the executive assistant to John Duffy. And John was very gracious in bringing me on board and giving me interesting things to do. And it just sort of blossomed from there. So you would be somebody who I think would be capable of talking us through some stuff that probably a lot of other people would not be. And that is really the evolution of the EPT. You know, we see it in its uh, current form, which is just so massive and just, you know, these just gazil the tournament schedules that are just mind boggling. And uh, even for me, having, you know, started in the 2010 ish, 2011 ish time um, traveling the circuits, even I've seen us go from, you know, having one conference room center to just like having to add in like 17 tents and like an annex building. And, you know, it's really, really exploded. So can you talk to us about really some of the earlier events, some of the beginning pieces, if you will? You know, if you saw, if you go back and you look at the old EPT footage, that really gives you a sense of what things were like in the old days, because, you know, if you, 
if you come from the American casino world and you're used to seeing Vegas casinos that are the size of, I mean, a Vegas casino is practically a size definition in and of itself, right? I mean, they're just, they're just it, is, it is equivalent to, if you look up humongous in the dictionary, you see a picture of a Vegas strip casino. That is not what casinos in Europe look like. They're little itty bitty things because they're just on street corners like, like everything else because uh, they don't stick them out in the middle of the desert. Um, so they were very small and they don't have, they don't have like these giant Mongo conference spaces that have been turned into the World Series or, or whatever like that, right? So it would just be like, okay, well, we'll move a few blackjack tables out of the way and, you know, and they, they're not even like that big on slot machines either by and large, right? So it's just like, okay, we can squeeze some relatively small number of tables and there, here's one over by the kitchen and blah, blah, blah. So that was very much what we were doing. And it was, or you'd be in the basement of a casino, you know, like whatever. In Warsaw, we were in the basement. Um, but that was the thing. So what that meant was is that one, it wasn't humongous. The, the fields were a couple of hundred, 300 people. And it meant that everybody knew everybody because they're just, it wasn't a field of 500 or a thousand or 4,000 people. It was just, you know, it was the same, it was the same 150 people or the same hundred people with 150 locals. And of course, every time you go back to one of those, you'd see the same 150 locals. So it, it really became kind of a family. And John Duthie, I didn't, never really appreciated this, but John Duthie knew every one of those 150 regulars or whoever they were, right? I mean, he was so wired into European poker. And so when he said, yeah, I'm going to put together this poker tour using the money that he'd won by winning the uh, poker millions on the Isle of Man, everybody just said, oh, John Duthie's putting on an event. I'll, I'll rock up there. And, and, and that's how it happened. So yeah, it was, it was small. I mean, I Copenhagen, tiny, mm -hmm. um, you know, Warsaw, tiny, Barcelona, tiny, little, little itty bitty places. And, and you'd squeeze past the blackjack tables to get, get to the poker rooms and um, the poker rooms that they sort of created. And it was small and, and intimate and ridiculous amounts of fun. It's so true. And I think it built a, a family style atmosphere that followed it throughout all of its years, really. And there were always these core people that had been there in the beginning. And really, a lot of them are still there, which is amazing mm -hmm. and impressive. And I wanted to talk to you because, you know, people have asked me this before. And I struggle sometimes there are certain things that stand out to me other things I think I think I will remember them and then they just slip away but do you have specific winners and winner moments that really stand out to you where you realized sort of you know in in this moment like wow this was so epic or oh I'm gonna remember this forever and that you still do uh there's a few things um you know, it's quite often when the winter happened, everybody was so exhausted. <laughs> you don't particularly remember that moment because all you remember thinking is bed. I get to go to bed. <laughs> it's so true. So many times people ask me and I can remember so many times being, you know, present and thinking, oh, this is like, I'm really glad this person won or, oh, this is exciting. But then just, you don't sleep for the next 24 hours because you fly home right away or whatever it is. It's just, it's a lot of these memories have just evaporated until someone reminds me. Now, I, there, there are a couple things. Um, let, let's start with uh, Mike McDonald, Timex, who of course is legendary across the poker and crypto worlds. Um, he was just barely 18 when he won Dortmund. And so there's this kid standing up there with his braces and it was just, it, it was just amazing to see. I just remember that because he looked like he was supposed to be going to biology class in high school. 
and maybe he was supposed to be going to biology class and I, I don't know but I'm talking um, to him in like two hours by the way so we'll uh we'll bring up the mention great okay well i mean there's there's actually a great story because um i i remember sitting at the one of the big breakfast buffets that they had. it was probably at dortmund and it was always funny because just when the breakfast buffet would get ready to close you'd see all the poker players come running in because they'd been up till three in the morning right and so they they wanted to get down there and get the free brunch at, at that point before they closed up and I was sitting there and um, he came he came cruising in in his pajamas and, and I just looked at somebody else at the table and I said pajamas at breakfast and, and the guy just goes he is Timex, you are not, <laughs> right? And that just pretty much summed it up. He is Timex, you are not. Um, and but we've yeah, all you know, been living in that shadow for the rest. Right, of for the, for, the yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, it's Timex's world and we're just living in it, yeah. right? But uh, yeah, you know, so it's, um, I remember um, Andres Hoivold winning. Um, I wish I could tell you where it was. <laughs> But I mean, it was like maybe the first time they had one of the confetti cannons or something. Yeah, I was like, why? Why does this one stand out? I think maybe I think maybe it was the confetti cannon. Um, yeah, there's just there was one. Um, but the, yeah, those were the ones that really stuck out. Oh because my gosh, I, there's a confetti cannon that I'll never forget. And now I'm totally blanking on the name and it's killing me. He's like a, um, such a boss, like like a Russian maybe. Uh, oh my gosh, I can see his face. He wears a fanny pack. Was oh, it London? He's like a high roller. No, it was in Barcelona. He won a high roller. In Bar okay. In All Barcelona. Right. Oh my gosh, I can see. He's such a sicko. He's like a Russian sicko. Okay, anyways, I'm gonna figure this out. But it was really funny because he was standing there, like, you know, doing the video stuff, like, you know, holding the trophy up. He's obviously just kind of like, you know, not that interested in what this whole like show anyways, but he's just doing it and dealing with it. Right. And then the confetti cannon goes off and you can tell it scares him so much. It goes all in his face. He like lost it for a second. And me and Montevideo and all the, the video people were just like, oh, this is a moment. This is a moment. I'm not. There aren't that many. Do, do not miss this yeah, shot. <laughs> this was so good. Oh my gosh, it was so funny. And I was just thinking, it's so great because the confetti cannon is a really fun, cool thing on camera. But if you scare the bejesus out of someone in the process, you can't really use that shot. It really like loses its magic, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, I have to. But yeah, um, those. So I, I wouldn't say, interestingly, it wasn't. I mean, in some ways, maybe the poker, like it was really important that everybody won all that money and everything. But somehow that particularly winning moment was never the thing that really stuck with me. It, it, was, it was the other moments that went with it. You just got very quiet. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to unmute myself and I, could, I had like too many pages open. I couldn't find it. So tell me. <laughs> Give me an example of then, you know, a memory, a moment, like something that you, that you do remember. What are some of the things that do stand out to you? You know, the things that stand out in every, everything that you do like that are the people. Um, at least for me, it's, it's always the people. And, and, the, and the first name that I just have to bring up is Thor Hansen. And Thor, I mean, God rest his soul. He, he was so warm and gracious and the, the, he brought the party to the table. And then when he busted out, the party just continued with him. And what I particularly remember was one of the first EPT events that I was at. And I was, you know, I was, I was the new kid on the block and I didn't know anybody. And you know, I wasn't cool and everybody else was cool, which was fine, right? You know, and I was just like walking somewhere and there, you know, Thor was like holding court as he would. And I don't even, he, he may have had, he has somebody my name or something, I don't know, but he goes, Lee, come over here. And it was like, I was his best friend and he had just seen, happened to see me walking through this casino in 
in Barcelona, right? And uh, ever thereafter, he would just stop and, um, you know, and, and say, how are you? And he would talk to me. And I realized that he was that way with every single human being on the tour. I remember and, interviewing him also. And someone had said, you know, he has cancer and like, it's, we haven't seen him in a couple of years or whatever. And he was there, I think at EPC Barcelona. And I was super nervous to interview him. And like, this is a, you know, it can be a touchy subject that a lot of people don't feel comfortable sharing with people anyways. And he was just like, he had me rolling at the end of the interview, like just laughing. And he was so open about his experience and what he was going through and just feeling really lucky to be there. And like, I just was like, those moments do stand out always to me too, where I start really nervous. Then it makes it so much better when someone makes me feel comfortable, right? When the interview subject is the one who's like, don't worry, girl. Like we got this. And right, right. He definitely so, made a, a mark. So it was Thor. It was um, Casey. I can't think of his last name. Casey from oh my gosh. Slovenia. Casey, Just... who who basically single handedly put smoking out of casinos. I feel like I, I saw him once in Australia and he had like this uh, fisherman's hat with all these little like hooks and like dangly things on it. That's how I that first, fit him. Yes, yeah. that's how I first met him. And then like always that's what is in my mind uh, when I think of him. Oh my gosh. We will think of his name, the but names, right? I, it's awful. You know, don't get old. It's hard. Um, but Casey was another one who would always uh, just just, you know, he would win, he would lose, but he, I mean, I'm, he would like, if he won, if he lost in tournaments, he didn't care because it's going to go for the PLO game and take all the money anyway. So it's like, whatever. And as a matter of fact, I will never forget watching the 2003 World Series ESPN video. And you just see him pass through the scene. I was like, oh Casey my God, Castle. this Casey Castle. Yes. Casey Castle. And I remember thinking that he would, that, seeing it there it's like like he was there forever right I mean he had been there in the 2003 World Series and thank you for that last name but he was always so gracious and as a matter of fact he has he has left something with me that I do to this day is when he would put out a bet he would say please and he would he would go 150 please and he would put out his 150 and I now do it and this gets comments, and, and I've just, it's just become a, a thing that I do when I'm betting, and I get comments wherever I am, whenever I get to play live poker again. But you know, it's like that has become something that I say, 125, please. It's so funny those little, like eccentricities, those little kind of stylistic choices that make a difference and that make and somebody so themselves. It was, it was, you know, or um, you know, just. Those, those are the things that I remember is the people. And, and I have to say that in some ways, and, and I've used this analogy before, but it was like running away and joining the circus because we would go from, I mean, it's like you had this circus, right? And we would go from city to city and set up the tent and then all the people would come to the circus. And then when the circus was over, we put the tent back on the trucks. And, and in many cases, it was literally, you know, like the, the big 18 wheelers that I'm sure you saw parked out behind the building, right? And speaking and, of people, even that group of guys who was the people who would bring all this stuff like five yes. or six days before, and then like take things down piece by piece, and then would be the guys at the very end pulling everything apart. You get to know those guys, those guys you go have beers with and, and hang out with. And it, it definitely did become where you just, I can remember so many times being so jet lagged, just so tired. I'd always get drunk on the plane on the way over, like sleep four hours, you know, try to stay awake the first night so that I could, you know, reset my clock or whatever, but just being exhausted, just generally exhausted. And, but then like you would just walk in and it'd be like, oh, what's up? Oh, what's up this person? Like there were so many people that you felt connected to in so many different ways that it totally combated the the jet lag because you were just like surrounded by so much 
energy and so many just wonderful people. Right, exactly. And um, so it was not only the players, but the, the colleagues that I had. And as you say, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the guys that drove the truck. Only well, he called it a lorry because he was old school Brit. And, and he walked with, he had this sailor's waddle and he would just, he would, whenever you'd show up, there he'd be with a roll of duct tape, you know, putting something together or taking something apart. And he was, he was as much a part of the team as anybody. And, you know, and he would just like show, and I always kind of wondered where those guys went <laughs> during the middle, <laughs> you know? Because yeah. they'd be ha- they'd be halfway across they'd be all the way across the continent. They and went they to have, the pub. I'm pretty sure. I, I'd be for four days, right? I mean, <laughs> like, I I think actually they had hotel rooms in in the in the city. Yeah. And they would essentially just go to ground and probably try to get some sleep because then four days later they'd have to come back and strike the whole set. Yeah. And put it in the in the truck and then drive it off to the next destination no they were amazing I'm with you and And I know exactly who you're talking about too yeah and so it was that was the thing it was it was all the players there was the guy who had the crazy mane of hair and he had he wore contacts that gave him a monster look okay I do not remember that guy somebody okay one of one of your listeners will know who I'm talking about because he had this long hair made him look kind of like I don't know, Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull or something like that, but he wore these crazy alien contacts. So when you were looking at, I think he was Scandinavian. Um, okay, well, he sounds terrifying. But when he would, so he would wear these alien contacts when he was at the table. So you got this very bizarre look. But yeah, it was just, that was really the, those were the, it wasn't so much the moments per se as the people and the interactions. Um, And Duthie, part of it was, is that Duthie was so laid back. I mean, no matter what would be going wrong, like John would come in and uh, he'd always have a cappuccino, you know, and I, and he'd, he'd be sitting there sipping his cappuccino and he'd say, you know, do we have cards? And we go, yeah, we have cards. And he says, do we have chips? There's like, like a couple yeah, we things got, we might need here. Yeah, we got chips. And he and he's like, okay, we're good to go. And, and there was a one, there was one, and I don't remember which one it was, but the dealer buttons didn't show up. And I don't remember what we used, or maybe like everybody at the table just used some random thing like they used their phone or, you know, like whatever. And it was like, okay, that was the button until the next day when the buttons showed up. Just but gotta make like, do. You just, just gotta, gotta make, make do. do. And like, you just, John was just real clear. If we have cards and chips, everything everything else can be sorted. Right? Well, you think about all the logistics of just putting on any event, right? Like even, you know, when I got married and just thinking about all the little things, like if you miss one thing, like you forget to get the porta potties or whatever, like you just forget one thing and like the whole thing goes up in flames. So it is these little nuances. And, and I do think that's one of the things that made this tournament series so respected and appreciated is that you know it had it been around for so long and it had just figured it out basically just figured out exactly how to transport things exactly how to you know get the right dealers and get I mean it's really and I think you know before I let you go I would be remiss if we didn't at least talk about you know where we are at this point in 2020 as a poker community we've all basically just come together and been like okay this is this is the hand, if you will, that's a terrible pun, but this is the hand we've been dealt. And this is what we're gonna do. So this week we have the EPT going online. What Mm -hmm. is that for you, for someone who has, you know, all these memories and these histories. And for those of us who know that the EPT is really about the people, what does it mean to have the EPT be online in 2020? Um, You know, as humans, we, we're adaptable, right? I mean, like we all want to play poker and we all want to gather and not in that order, but that's what we want to do. Um, Right now, we don't really have the option of gathering 
face to face and it sucks. Um, and it's, and it's miserable. And I hate that I don't, you know, I don't get to show up and, and hug people that I care about, but we do what we got to do. And, and so we meet virtually, we meet through zoom and we, we play poker over the computer and certainly online poker was thriving, you know, long before COVID. And I presume it will continue to thrive long after COVID. Um, but I think this is, this is, as you say, it's the hand we were dealt. And so we will get through it and we will, we will miss the, we will miss the beers and the sushi that we had together. And we will stay in touch with each other and we'll play poker because it's fun and it's, it's, um, it's the competition and, and there's the opportunity to win and there's, there's big exciting moments and, and they happen online. Just, you know, it's not quite, it's not quite the thrill and we can't have a confetti cannon and that sucks, but uh, yeah. Oh, but, speaking of, it was Vitaly Lunkin. Vitaly, there we go. See, if you'd had, if you'd had James Hardigan there, we, we, we would have known the answer immediately, right? Oh my gosh, I was dying inside, but. It's so true. And I think, you know, I'm really impressed with the, the poker community as a whole and with the, you know, poker clients that all of us either work for or work with that have just, you know, shifted what we're doing, tried to make things as grand and epic as they can, tried to keep think people as engaged as they can, try to keep mm -hmm. progressing and moving forward because, you know, we're, we're not the bosses of <laughs> how to control diseases that's for sure a and right. also just you know even what we've done in relationship to black friday how we've moved in relationship to big blind aunties or you know readjusting like how many revise re-entries you know uh, tournament structures like i think i just it's one of the things that always makes me the most proud about being a part of this community a i think we do a lot of charity work but b that we're always looking to improve always looking to make a better experience and a better environment for everyone and I think there's a lot of industries where you would be hard pressed to find that at sort of the heart and the core of what everyone's doing. So I'm hats off to, to poker stars for, for putting this EPT online. And I, I hope it's as successful and has the same, that it brings the same heart that we've all experienced at that tour. Well, I think part of one of the reasons that that happens is, is that this industry is built around a game. And certainly there's some people that are making money at it but at, at its core, we're all playing a, you know, we are involved in a silly card game together. And that's part of what really makes the whole vibe. Everybody is there to have fun in one way or another, right? You and I work in the entertainment industry and that's, that's part of it. And, and before we sign off, I know you're, you're doing this thing with the EPT. And so for all the people that you interview, Timex and everybody else, I just want to say, if you were at the EPT, if you were a dealer on the EPT, and boy, some of the dealers I, I remember, um, but if you were any, if you were a player, a dealer, if you were the guy that drove the truck, whatever, um, I have, and or if you were a woman standing there on video doing interviews, um, I have a huge debt to you. I I don't think I'll ever have a job that was near as much fun as as I had on the EPT. And, and indeed, it was the people that made it so much fun. And I was proud and ridiculously fortunate to be part of it. Agreed. And I thought about adding something, but I think actually that's the perfect write-off. That's just the perfect send-off for Lee Jones. If you guys want to follow, Lee has all kinds of exciting stuff still, of course, in the poker space. Poker Simple is a project with Tommy Angelo. Uh, are you guys still doing that all? And how do they, how do our listeners check that out? Should they want to? Um, poker Simple is still out there. We are not making new videos because all the fun we had was sitting in the same room and, and working together and we can't do that anymore. So bleh. Um, mm. But Tommy has his own projects um, and you can go to TommyAngelo.com and see them. And I have my own projects and uh, you can go to leejones.com and see those. And I'm also writing for the Global Poker blog if you want to track that down. But yeah, it's, it's all good. I love your writing. I will definitely track that down. Thank you so much for taking the time. Lee Jones, you guys. And on to the next. Now, Chad, although we have 
mentioned a lot, I think, of the people who made a huge difference to all of us, the, you know, Mad Harpers, the Luca, Tony, the, you know, the, the tournament directors, the people on the floor, the staff, the, all of these people made a huge difference. But I wanted to get your taste because I think coming from the video perspective, of course, I developed a sort of core group of people that I could go to for good, interesting, you know, fun content who were receptive to me. But I feel like coming from the writing side, other people may have stood out to you. Who were some of the players that were kind of, you know, your your go to players, if you will? Well, let me give a quick shout out before I get into the players, just to the Poker Stars blog team. So they were the other half of the media that were always in the media room and all the EPT stops. And I got to know them really well over the years. Uh, Brad Willis would be the head of that. Martin Harris, uh, formerly of Poker News, was also often there. But the UK guys were always there and Howard, Stephen, and Rick. And I remember the first time I met them all, I think it was in uh, EPT Prague way back in the day. And I had this image in my head that these three guys lived together in London somewhere. They were like these wacky roommates. So that would just travel, you know, it wasn't the case. They all had their own lives and their own families, but uh, that was the image in my head. And I certainly got to, to know those guys over the years, really appreciate it. Still call them friends today, even though we don't see each other nearly as much. So. Which by the way, Lee and I got in about a 20 minute conversation after my interview with Lee, where we were talking about Rick Dacey, Stephen Bartley and Howard Swains. And get this, just in case you didn't know, Rick Dacey now manages a, or runs a <laughs> distillery in the Isle of Man. You knew that? I did. Yeah. I'm friends on Facebook. So I see the updates and I want to get over there. They just made a batch of rum and you know, I like some rum. So I got to, got to get my hands on it somehow, but uh, yeah, really excited to see that. I know that Stephen was like the, um, I don't know what the, the equivalent is in the UK, but like the mayor of Whitstable, which is uh, the town he lives in just outside of London. Uh, so he was in local politics there. Howard did a book years ago about a guy named Sarno who lived in the African rainforest and was this American guy who lived there, immersed himself and like uh, learned this specialized music. And it was just this really wild book about a guy who gave up life in America and went and lived in the jungle and, you know, became part of this tribe and started a family and uh, really enjoyed reading that book. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's cool. Like these guys are poker writers, but they got a lot going on outside of the poker world as well. Uh, unlike you and I, Sarah, who just, this is all Loser. we do. Just, yeah, no. just <laughs> for sure. For sure. And they are, they were so funny. I think one of the things that really took me by surprise with these gentlemen is that they, you know, seem very prim and proper and they've got their serious men shoes on and their serious jackets or whatever. And then you sit down with them and they just have this sardonic wit and just very, just funny. You just wouldn't guess how funny and fun they were. And I too enjoyed many a breakfast with them um, in the mornings, just cracking me up and preparing us for the day. But yeah, talk to me about some of the, the players that really stand out to you. I know one that really stands out to me is because I only really ever seen him um, on the EBT was Steve O'Dwyer, right? He really stopped coming to American events, the World Series and all that. But he was always somebody you could rely on to be at the EPTs. And not only that, he, you could always rely on him to do quite well in these EPTs. So certainly remember seeing him everywhere. Charlie Carroll is another one that we, I remember um, kind of watching grow up, if you will, on the EPT a little bit. He was just this young guy with his Justin Bieber hair at the time and really came on. Now he's crushing, you know, high rollers and what have you. Uh, he's a name that certainly stands out and then there's just those localized guys like Govert Mittal I, I don't know he never won an EPT but you would always see Govert you know he's from the Netherlands one of their better players and just getting to know those sorts of guys you knew um, from Scotland Ludovic Gaelic with his you know really thick rough uh, Scottish accent um, I remember um, all kinds of guys from the UK you'd even get people traveling over from Canada in fact I got to know a lot of the Canadian contingent from the EPTs because of the tax laws, they tended to avoid the US events, but they would always travel over to these EPT events. So that's where, you know, I would get to, to know a Mike Watson or a Mark Andre Latissour, uh, those sort of guys. So I would always definitely touch base with all of those guys. And it was just a family feel, as you've mentioned a little bit throughout the show, because you'd see the same people, whether they're players, staff at each stop. And you just, you know, this was an escape from everybody's real life. 
we were there to play poker. We were there for a festival. We were there to have fun. And uh, man, I, sh I sure do miss it. The more I talk about it here, it's, uh, it's definitely making me wish there were some EPTs, live EPTs to be enjoying. Um, the online version, though, is going to have to suffice for now. Well, and it's really interesting because I can remember then coming to cover the World Series of Poker and feeling in some ways like I had a mu much more wide ranging player pool with which to draw from, I would quite frequently even be dealing with bloggers who I would say, oh, you don't know that guy, you know, that's this guy, that's this guy, which on the EPT, I'm just never, everyone on the EPT knew everyone and always knew way more people than I did. But I feel like because of the European Poker Tour's ability to attract, they were bringing always players from South America. Of course, all of the, the Scandies, the Canadians, as you mentioned, Australia's, it was such a, a powerhouse of of poker that really everybody ended up there and it did make it so I think I knew a lot of players that I would never have known had I not spent as much time as I did on the EPT and I really value that I will always be grateful for that you know knowledge and those relationships and you mentioned Steve O'Dwyer it's funny because when you and I were talking about who were some of the most iconic faces we wanted to talk to I of course was thinking probably the person I interviewed the most in pro mostly probably my career, but certainly on the EPT was Steve O'Dwyer <laughs> because it was just a winner interview every other day, basically. Um, and I thought about reaching out to him, but I kind of thought that mm, probably just wouldn't work out anyways. But the other face that everyone kept mentioning was Mike McDonald. He really grew up on the EPT. He had his first major win at 18 years old, the youngest ever player to win an EPT. And he, he just, it's interesting because as you've seen his career evolve both in poker and outside of poker, he really does, I think, personify what a lot of us who started on the EPT should be striving to do with our lives. He's building businesses. He's contributing to charity. He's just very, I think, active and engaged in lots of elements of his life. He's into physical fitness. And uh, the Bank of Timex has made for probably more interesting content for me over the course of the last decade than even the Negranu Polk feud. So let's welcome to the show the man, Mike McDonald. Well, it is the man we have been waiting for, one whom many people have brought up in the context of this European Poker Tour episode. Mike Timex McDonald, welcome to the show, my dear. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. So Mike, the, I'll catch you up. Basically, we've been talking a lot about, you know, favorite stops, favorite memories, giving the audience a sort of, you know, behind the scenes taste of the EPT, maybe things they didn't know or see before. And you certainly are someone who many people have brought up as one of their favorite or one of the most profound memories that people have is of you winning at the tender age of 18 years old. It was really sort of symbolic of so many things, I think, about poker and the hope for poker at that time. So straight from the horse's mouth, just talk to us, first of all, about, about the experience of winning an EPT title, you know, before you could even drink in the United States, for example. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, the one thing I guess I, I, I will say is that, um, you know, I, I think everyone when they were when they were 18 years old or 16 years old or anything like that, they kind of picture like they picture themselves as a full adult. You know, they, they think that, you know, they think they're more grown up than they are, et cetera. And, and definitely um, when I look back at pictures of myself playing that tournament, I'm like, oh, my God, I was such a kid. But in the moment. You know, I felt like I'm as mature and prepared as anyone. You know, I think I think it's maybe a bit of a self-conscious 18-year-old and whatnot. You almost overcompensate and think you're, you know, probably thought I had my life together more when I was 18 than I do now at 31. So it didn't it didn't really feel strange to me at the time. Um, and there used to be so many good um, teenage players back in the day that it didn't. You know, I never once thought, hey, uh, whatever it is, 12, 13 years later, that the record would still stand. 
like I know the record of youngest person to win a major tournament used to get broken every four months or something like that. You know, a 20 year old wins the 19 and a half, the 19, you know, it, it just was such a common thing. Uh, 18 and four months or 18 and five months or whatnot didn't feel that young in the grand scheme of things, especially when you look at youngest world series bracelet winner, it's like 21 and six days or something. I just kind of assumed it would be a matter of time before younger people start winning tournaments. But you know, the, the landscape of uh, high level poker really changed and they're, there aren't as many teenage players playing at the high level as there as there used to be. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. It didn't feel that weird in the moment, to be honest. Well, that's something else that I think has come up several times in this show. And I'm interested to get your perspective. Basically, when we look at the way that the EPT was for many years and this sort of core crew, the way the schedules were, uh, you know, the different sort of places where the tournament stops were going versus where we sort of have evolved to now, much less stops, much larger schedules, probably a different core group of people going if there's a certain core group um, at all. And then a lot of these people who were traveling the circuit every stop all the time, you know, three or four years ago have maybe moved on to, I don't know if it's like we're all adulting now or what's happening, but maybe I think people are more inclined to go to a stop here or there. Maybe if one catches their fancy or, you know, works into their schedule as someone who really was there sort of from the beginning, how do you see the way that things have shifted now? Well, I mean, so the one thing I'll say is I haven't played in four years, so I don't really know what things are like now, you know, if you were to say, if you were to take a player, you know, give me uh, Isaac Haxton or whatnot. I have no idea how many tournaments Isaac Haxton plays or anything. Um, so I'm really, I'm really not that equipped. I can, I can say from um, 2008 to 2016, I definitely noticed, you know, a big, uh, a, a very, very small number of the people that were kind of the top players in 2007, 2008 were still the top players, you know, nine years later. Um, and then it seems like, uh, there's been an even more aggressive shift in the last few years where, you know, now people are getting to the age that more people will have kids, you know, more people will have kind of, you know, steady lives, you know, there'll be more, uh, more people have kind of left the, you know, uh, victory chasing and title chasing and are kind of aiming from kind of more, uh, uh, stable lifestyle, I suppose, and less, you know, you could, the, the whole live, living out of hotels, you know, is, is way, <laughs> I think at least is way more exciting kind of late teens to mid twenties than it is, you know, when you're, when you're 40 or 50 or, you know, some people still travel the circuit in their sixties and whatnot, but it seems, it seems so perfect when you're, you know, when you're young, when you're single, et cetera. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that probably has, uh, has, has kind of slowed down the number of people that are at a different stop, you know, 40, 45 weeks a year, et cetera. I totally agree. And it's interesting you bring up, you know, not having been around the scene for a couple of years, because this is one of the things that I talked about a little bit earlier in the show is that I think for, this is maybe a little bit of pressure to put on you, but for one of the players who has really embodied, I think a lot of the things that a lot of players have hoped for or wanted to do with their lives. I know a lot of poker players who had said, I would like to start a business at some point. I don't want to be playing full-time forever. I would like to do, you know, some other avenues. And a lot of times that actually, I haven't seen that come into fruition where for you, I feel like you have your, your hand in a lot of, a lot of things outside of poker that are both lucrative, but also interesting. So for those who are listening, can you talk to us about some of the other, you know, projects that you're invested in and, and that you've been working on for years now? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the most notable one um, would be poker shares, obviously, you know, um, and that was just, you know, it just felt like there's always been such a big market for investing in players, betting who's going to win, betting who's going to lose, etc. cetera. Um, and we just kind of, you know, we just kind of thought that, uh, there wasn't really a platform that would kind of take on the degree of action that most players are looking for. Um, and also kind of be, you know, a fully trusted platform rather than just, you know, some random sports book that pops out and you don't know who the founders are or anything like that. So, so I think that that was, um, I think that was something that, you know, was quite, uh, quite exciting to get started with. And then on, and then on top of that, I've also been getting um, over the last, 
few years much more involved in cryptocurrencies and crypto trading in general. Um, so that has been, uh, those have been kind of two of the, uh, two of the kind of main focuses, uh, post poker. That's so interesting. It's, uh, you know, I think because of the volatility in crypto, it's really such a, a ama- there's so much potential to make money if you have even like a cursory understanding of, of trading. And I think for poker players who understand risk, it's such a cool, uh, direction to go. And actually it was funny because I was interviewing Kevin McPhee and I was just looking, you know, who was at his final table and, um, Marco Newman, who's married to a friend of mine, uh, Renee Garcia, uh, was at that final table and I was sending him pictures and we were talking and he was like, dude, 2010, if I would have put it all, everything I wanted to Bitcoin right now, like we'd be so set, but he's also, you know, really uh, deeply invested in the crypto space. And it's interesting for me to hear from someone that's been more active, mostly just in the last couple of years. I feel like so many people who are, are working in crypto have been, you know, involved since six years ago, maybe something like that. So talk to me a little bit about choosing to, to jump in. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that, um, I mean, so I guess, I guess the kind of interest in the crypto in general is just, um, I mean, so for, I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people use the expression, you know, like come for the gains, stay for the revolution kind of thing where, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, I think when they first get into Bitcoin or they first start reading about Bitcoin, they're very much viewing it as kind of, uh, you know, as kind of a, um, okay, can this go up in value? Could I make 50% by buying this and selling this? Or, or you know, could I make 100% or what, whatever kind of the goal is there? And then I think sort of the the more time you spend around it, the, the less you become sort of concerned with, with the price and the more you kind of become concerned with just, hey, like, you know, the US dollar is being printed so aggressively. You know, every, every asset that people own you've already had people buy that asset before you want it. Like if you, you know, if you're buying a house, you know, you're the person who's making all the money on the house is the person who bought that house a generation ago or inherited it three generations ago, especially in a scarce area. And, you know, most, most things you can invest in are, you know, people have already uh, taken advantage of so much of the kind of profit opportunity there. And then just having something that having something that just isn't denominated in U S dollars I think is just, it's just so nice and just sort of realizing how, not, not to go on too much of a tangent, just like how corrupt everyone in charge is and how, how much the, uh, the policy that gets put in, put in place uh, takes advantage of, you know, those who are earning and uh, gives to those that are owning. And it's just, you know, owning something that is sort of outside of that system is uh, fairly attractive. And then as far as uh, beyond beyond just, you know, that would be kind of some of the motivation for buying holding Bitcoin. But beyond that, um, just sort of throughout 2017, uh, a friend of mine and I, we just noticed that um, the pricing on different exchanges was, was routinely um, kind of out of whack. Uh, you know, you'd see Ethereum for $300 on one exchange and $295 on another exchange. And we'd literally just sit at our computer and buy in one place, sell in another place. And it was, it, you know, everybody thinks markets are efficient and everybody thinks that, oh, you know, everything's perfectly priced, et cetera. But we'd literally just sit there doing kind of like arbitrage by hand. And that's how kind of soft the markets were. And we just sort of realized, hey, there, there really is an opportunity here. Um, and so, you know, we started, we started, neither of us are technical ourselves. We started kind of hiring developers to build things to kind of you know, arbitrage all the major crypto exchanges and just kind of get, you know, anytime anything is mispriced, try to be able to trade it there. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't really think that, you know, a couple of a couple of poker players who you know don't have coding backgrounds or anything would be able to do decent in that space. But it kind of speaks to how how soft it was through 2017, 2018. I mean, these days we're still we're still more than covering costs, but it's still um, it's not particularly um, exciting, I guess. Uh, you know, the 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 people that are the best in this space, I think, have done uh, well enough that the people like us who are kind of doing like a B or B minus type job aren't getting as big of a slice of the pie, I suppose. Um, you know, there's, I think it's still decent, but it's not a uh, it's not really something that I think is uh, overly exciting. We're more just kind of like you know, waiting until we can't cover costs and then shut it down kind of thing. 
Uh, but that's sort of been, um, that, but yeah, that's sort of been, been a, a big emphasis as well, where it was just kind of, it was just kind of an opportunity to be sort of uh, counter trading all of the sort of euphoria that's uh, been going on in the space. It's so crazy. I can remember literally my husband and I doing similar things where it was like the difference on Litecoin was like 60 bucks between exchanges. I was like, 60 bucks? Like, this is insane. It just was so, I was like, there's no way this is real. Like, I'm thinking like, this has got to be fake. But yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on just all fronts and on understanding, you know, what the value of any currency really is or what it's based on. And, uh, you know, the, the, printing of money that's just it there are so that could be a whole other podcast but I, I, <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah let's focus on the poker I don't let's not get too uh, sidetracked I fully fully couldn't agree with you more though and I think it's it's also you know it's one of the things in talking about the EPT though is also looking at where people are now you know how these sort of foundational and, and fundamental moments in our lives have shaped us in ways that have put us in the positions, you know, to make the right decisions now or to, you know, sort of forward, forward our lives now. And I guess before, I don't want to like keep you, I don't want to keep you for too long. And I'm sure this podcast is already super, super long, but I wanted to talk to you about as someone who had seen a lot a lot of stops and clearly I'm sure has like a ton of awesome memories with tons of really interesting friends. Um, first of all, I wanted to know if there are some friendships that you really made in that, that life of traveling the EPT circuit that have, have spanned the years. And then also if there are any, you know, stops outside of, of your victory, obviously, but stops or memories, moments that, that really stand out to you. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that, um, I, I guess, so I, I suppose it's a little bit of a blend where just um, the, uh, you know, the kind of the poker friendships you make, you know, you make some, you hang out at EPTs and then you hang out at Aussie Millions and then you hang out the, at the World Series, etc. So, you know, that, uh, you know, I mean, most, most of my friends to this day are people that I met, you know, 10, 15 years ago while playing poker kind of thing. You know, I think, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's something about, uh, about getting older or whatnot, but I felt like I was, uh, you know, much, um, you know, much more kind of like prone to getting to know people, letting people in, et cetera, when I was younger than, you know, kind of now that I'm older, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that were my best friends 10 years ago are still some of my best friends today kind of thing. And I think that's been the case with a lot of, a lot of people around the kind of traveling poker community where you just have, you know, you just have kind of such a, niche job niche lifestyle that the other people that have chosen that same sort of path have a lot in common with you um and i think that that is uh you know been a you know yeah just been a big thing where even though most of the most of the guys that i used to travel the circuit with hardly any are still doing the circuit full-time these days but still just kind of you know, your life experiences, the way you look at the world, your perspective, etc. I think is, is quite similar amongst a lot of us. Um, as far as favorite, as far as favorite stops, I always really liked EPT Prague. I, I can't really, can't really put my finger on why, um, but it was just kind of, you know, most, you know, most, most places you go, I'd, there would be some things I'd like, some things I didn't like, but Prague was one that I feel like it's quite underrated where every year I was always looking forward to it. And I, there was never, there was none of the naked, like I feel like almost every stop had one or two things I felt pretty negatively about or whatnot. Um, and that, but Prague it was just, you know, every single year I was always, uh, I was always excited for that stop. I like, you know, that it's at, a, it's at a nice hotel and you play like right at the venue. Tournaments are good. The city is nice. It's kind of, you know, beautiful around Christmas. Um, always had a lot of friends who were going to Prague, it was usually a pretty soft series, et cetera. Um, so that was, that was always one of my favorite. As far, as far as moments that stick out the most, um, I mean, definitely playing, playing at a final table in PCA was, was so exciting. It was just, uh, it was just kind of, uh, I mean, first of all, it was such a long final table. I don't know what we played, 15 hours or something like that. And it was also just kind of this, just sort of a nice, um, I would say it was just kind of a nice sort of almost like culminating feeling uh, in poker, I guess, where I just kind of, I felt just so um, just kind of very low pressure while I was playing. And it was, you know, I'd already had maybe three or four final tables and, you know, 
eight top 20s or something, but it was just like most of the, so many of those came when I was 18, 19, 20 and whatnot. And it's like, this was now, you know, the biggest one. And it was when I was, you know, more mature. I had more, you know, a couple of years of super high rollers under my belt to where I was very comfortable with the stakes. And I felt very dialed in on all my opponents and to sort of see, and, you know, PCA is such a kind of uh, notable event that sort of being, seeing that kind of, you know, the room that you've seen every year for the last, who knows how many years, um, it just seeing the kind of field dwindle down from thousands to hundreds to dozens down to the final eight. And then, you know, it was also a big kind of, you know, big kind of media attention. Like I still, I still remember, I mean, one of the things that kind of stood out is the walk down to the final table when I was playing there where, you know, obviously they, they used to pay attention to who would be the first person to win two EPTs. So whenever I was deep in a tournament, they'd always put a little kind of extra hype uh, before Vicky Corrin won her second EPT. But I still remember I was, you know, you're at this like fancy resort and every year at the result resort, you see, you know, you see Michael Jordan or, you know, you see some random celebrities there and they, they had me walk from my hotel room down to the tournament room. And there was, you know, there was four photographers each filming me walking from different angles. One's watching my shoes. One's watching me from like waist height and everyone walking through who's, you know, all the poker players know who I am, but like the half of people on the resort who aren't poker players definitely thought I was like a real celebrity. <laughs> and this kind of walking through it where people are probably thinking like, Oh, this guy's a, musician or something like that was you know that that's definitely a moment that kind of stood out where it's like oh shit like they really uh are putting a lot into the production value of this and you know i'm i get pretty kind of caught up in the moment and just sort of think oh i'm just playing poker trying to you know beat these seven people or whatnot but through seeing like how how much attention was put to that event and then also having such a kind of you know, grueling uh, final table, grueling three-handed match, heads-up match, etc. It was just uh, that. I think that was probably one of the. Uh, that was probably, I guess, maybe my like favorite experience on the EPT. It was. It was quite. Uh, it was quite quite enjoyable. You know, winning would have been nice, but you know, as uh, you know, I was really uh, proud of Dominic, fun guy to uh, play against and get to know, and you know, played great. So yeah, I think that would be. Uh, that might be the thing that I kind of look at the most positively from uh, playing the EPT. That's amazing that you can have come in runner up and, and still recognize just how powerful and cool that that moment and that experience was. And it's so funny because actually I, I had to apologize to Dominic Panka multiple times because also when you look at the media, I'm pretty sure that the entire room of people was all rooting for you. I mean, for us, it was just, it was a story, but we also all, you know, knew you at that point and we all you know, recognize like what a great, it would just be, it would be a great story. <laughs> it would be a great interview. And we were all just, when, when Dominic won, I remember just being like, are you serious? It's like six <laughs> in the morning. This is the interview we're going for now. I was so annoyed, but it was, that was definitely a moment, you know, I think that stands out to a lot of us actually. And, and really, a, you know, it, it really speaks to, like you said, you know, your ability as a poker player to be able to, after you know, a decade of, of, you know, playing these live tournaments to still be able to, to crush in those gigantic fields. It's pretty, pretty impressive. I, yeah, hats off to you. Yeah, no, it definitely like it, it definitely felt, you know, I, I, I never really felt like my kind of style was that of someone who should crush main events. Like the guys who usually crush the main events, they have like a, you know, more, a more, uh, I'll say like a dominant type style, like the, you know, the Fader Holtzes, the Adrian Matioses, like they have a kind of, you know, a, a style that, you know, they're always winning twice their share of pots or whatnot. So I probably had a lot more luck on my side to have more so many main event runs. You know, I'm not complaining or anything, but it's definitely, you know, I, I would just, I would just sort of play main events and I would just sort of expect to do well in them. And I, I don't really know that the, the style I played or the decisions I made were really ones that, merited having one of the best you know kind of main event resumes you know ever in poker i suppose but hey i'm, I'm not complaining it, it definitely definitely worked out uh pretty well for me but yeah it was definitely uh it, it was it was nice um you know just five you know second in pca is just like you know i so easily could have just come you know sixth in some small ept you know getting getting those first seconds thirds um, in the tournaments where, you know, you don't really have investors or anything is it's pretty nice, I suppose. And it's, it was, you know, I think the PCA too, just the way they shoot it, the way that it's streamed, it was, it's just, it's one of the, it's one of the really, I think, premier events that sort of captures 
people all for all throughout the world are wanting to watch this this tournament and man i like i love the idea of thinking of you like having a kim kardashian you know moment or whatever <laughs> like going through the atlantis that will live on in my memories well i just i so appreciate you taking the time mike i i know that you have lots of things going on and i really genuinely appreciate it and for those who are listening who want to follow for those who just want to know what's going on with you or poker shares or you know any and all of your projects where can they find you uh yeah i mean um yeah mike mcdonald 89 on twitter is kind of the uh is kind of the main platform i use um if you kind of want to follow along or whatnot that's the best place for it Twitter. That's what it is for the po That's what everyone in poker says, Twitter. So it's great. We can keep it streamlined. Thank you so, so much for joining this special EPT edition of the podcast. And I just wish you luck in everything you do, Mike. All right. Great talk to you. Bye, Em. See ya. Bye. Well, I asked almost everyone to talk about, you know, a favorite moment, a favorite memory, a favorite champion. And it was interesting because I kind of anticipated that most everyone would snap go to the Vicky Corin winning the second EPT title ever. Because really, this was a storyline that was going forever and ever and ever. The, the, to have a two-time winner was something we were all waiting for all the time. And actually, no one brought it up. I was surprised. But then, Chad, you were already ready for it. Yeah, it was certainly a very special moment. As you said, it was a storyline that um, spanned the EPT for a very long time. So back in season three, we're talking back in 2006, uh, Vicky Corin won the EPT London, right? And great victory, took home half a million pounds, and then we get seasons going by seasons going by we're talking over a hundred EPT main events and there was no double winner during this time. You know, somebody who worked for a tour like the MSPT now granted these aren't, you know, 10 K buy-ins or what have you, but there's still $1,100 buy-in tournaments, uh, tough fields, they're mid majors. We had in the first hundred events, you know, multiple double winners. We had a three time winner during that period of time. And so it was just, crazy kind of that there wasn't a repeat winner on the EPT, especially as we mentioned throughout the show that when you're seeing the same people at a lot of different stops. Well, that finally changed in season 10. This is in 2014, April, when the EPT San Remo in Italy was happening. I was there and Vicky Corin took down that tournament for her second title, 476,000 euros. And it was just a very historic moment you can ask anybody who was there everyone was celebrating there was champagne being popped I believe they even brought some into the media room for us to share after the fact which was was really cool and you know Vicky Corin was uh, represented poker stars at one point in time she's very well known in the UK a very accomplished writer great poker ambassador and um, so her winning the second title was mainstream news in Europe and in the UK. And, uh, you know, there was no better really ambassador to win it, I think, than her. And I believe there's only been one other player who has since won uh, another title. So back in uh, 2012, uh, Mikolai Pobel won the EPT Barcelona. I was actually there for that one. It was a, a really big one, took it down for over a million euros. And then... Last year, the last event of 2019, the EPT Prague, he ended up winning that main event for, again, over a million euros. So I believe those are the only two-time EPT main event champs and certainly very memorable and historic for me. Were there any other winners i did just want to you know there were some times where we would just have like a sweat and it'd be like oh please this person has to win or um were there any other moments that really stood out to you as like wow that was that was an ept that's just gonna go down in history for me yeah there was it was um ept grand final in monte carlo and I believe it was, let me uh, pull this up. I just had it here. So EPT Monte Carlo was May of 2015. This was the end of season 11. And when we worked these events, usually towards the end, at least, there was the main event and the high roller and there would be overlap. So from a blogging perspective, we would get one or the other. And whenever you were done, 
you were done, right? And for the most part, the average of these tournaments finished pretty close to each other. Maybe the main event would get done an hour or two before or vice versa. But in this particular stop, it was very interesting. I got on the high roller and it was for whatever reason, it was me and uh, another reporter named Will. This was a particularly fast high roller. It was still daylight out when we finished and we're like, great, we're going to go out for an early dinner. We have early morning flights. We can actually enjoy the evening. Was it Too Alexandru bad. Papazian? That uh, won that one? Uh-huh. It could be because what I really remember was actually um, the, and I might be getting this one wrong. It's been several years. There was, uh, let me think about this, Sarah. Sorry, I should have been more prepared. There, it was a, So in the main event, the main event was heads up. And we're like, oh, the main event team is going to be done here any minute and they can join us. Long story short, it ended up being the longest heads up match. in. It was Jack Salter and the Italian guy. That's it. And it wasn't uh, what I was thinking. So yeah, it was Jack Salter and Antonio Bunanu. I think it was his name. And uh, thank you for for, uh, correcting me there. So the other team was there. We thought they were going to be done. Well, we go out to dinner and it's still going on. All right. Bad luck for them. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to bed. If it's still going on. All right. Bad luck for them. I wake up at like six in the morning to get, you know, the, the, the shuttle to my flight and that, that heads up match is still going on. It was unbelievable. It was so, it went on so long that the team had to be tapped out from afar. So other reporters woke up around the country, around the world. And were like, look, you've been working for like 16 hours straight. We'll take over the updates off the stream. You guys go, uh, you know, make your flight so you can get home. It was just, uh, and, and kudos to the EPT because they did change some things after that, uh, you know, shortening the levels during heads up play or something like that. They definitely made it a little more kind because they didn't want to go through that again. And I don't blame them. I also did not want to go through that ever again. It was horrific. And it was Alexandra Papazian because I remember this whole situation like it was yesterday. And we had had some pretty epic. I remember in Copenhagen, uh, we had... Um, Oh my gosh. Oh, I can see his, he's like the little Scandi, uh, Mickey, Mickey Peterson versus Pierre Noville. That was like an eight, seven and a half hour, I think heads up match, which I was like, this is the worst. It will never get worse than this. The play was just very slow. Pierre Noville is just a kind of slow thinking type guy. I love him, but God bless him. Um, and then this Jack Salter, but nanu thing was here was the worst part. Here's the nut low. We stay there until seven in the morning or whatever it is. The sun is literally coming up. The van is coming to pick us up to go to the airport. I'm getting ready to try to do the interview. And dude, homie doesn't speak a lick of English, <laughs> like not even a little bit of English. I was like, I'm sorry. So we just waited this entire time and I'm not even going to get an interview. That's exactly what happened. I barely got an interview. I had him just say he was happy or whatever. And somebody translated in Italian, but yeah, in terms of terrible memories, that's also in my uh, top, top list of worst, worst stops ever. And probably in everyone's, I'm pretty sure. I mean, for me, it was, it worked out. Cause I didn't, rec- you know, like I said, I was on the high roller. I was out of there. I had a great dinner. Um, I certainly felt bad for the team. I wouldn't have, you know, we're, we're six years removed or whatever it is now. So I can rub it in a little bit, but uh I can see it's still a sore subject with you. (laughs) Literally, I don't know that I went back. I think I went back one time after that. Basically, if there was any time or any possibility that I could get out of doing Monaco after that, I was like, I'm just not, I just got bad juju about Monaco. I got to get out of there. I'm sure lots of people like it, but. Well, let's talk about stops real quick to end this show, Sarah. So um, EPTs, I really did enjoy them all, but I definitely had stops that I liked better than others. For instance, I had some good times in Barcelona, but it wasn't my favorite stop. A lot of people love Barcelona. I wasn't as high on it as other people. One stop that I really did like, um, you know, Prague was always high on my list. Malta was high on my list. But I think my favorite stop um, ended up being in Vienna, Austria. And I say this for a few reasons. So I didn't start going to EPTs until I want to say season six-ish. No, I would have them in later than that. Season seven. So we're talking 2010, 2011 was the first time I really got to go to any EPTs. And prior to that, you know, the EPT has been around since 2004. They had went to a lot of cool stops that they no longer were going to. They didn't have EPT Snowfest any longer. They didn't have the uh, EPT Warsaw, EPT Baden. 
And so it ended up getting kind of consolidated where we were going to Barcelona, we were going to Prague, Deauville, um, San Remo in the, you know, the EPT Grand Final. So there were a lot of uh, repeat stops. But in season 10, which was 2014, they announced that they were going to go back to EPT Vienna. And I was excited about this because they had only been there twice before, once in 2010, and then the other time way back in 2005. It was a part of the world I've always wanted to go to, you know, as a history major, the, the World War II history that's there. And it just ended up being a really beautiful city, a really fun stop. We did a segue tour of the city. Um, and I don't know, I just, I really enjoyed the entire experience of, of going to Vienna and they have never been back since. So I'd really cherish that I got the opportunity to go to that one. And hopefully fingers crossed that they can go back someday because it, it, uh, it really was a great spot. I think a lot of players would like it. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Vienna because I, that was definitely one of the stops where I realized how cool it was that we were getting to travel all together and do all these things all together. And it's actually, there are some stops that I specifically was just so impressed with the rooms, the, the facility where the event was held in Vienna was just so gorgeous. The architecture was so pretty. It's the same in Deauville. I think Deauville just has this fantastic, I mean, obviously it was in a movie, you know, it, it sort of personifies just this grandeur and this old charm that I think a lot of people think about when they think about Europe. And I, yeah, th those are some of the stops where I will always think like when I would walk in in the morning, it's like entering a whole, you know, a whole different world. And I, I, the very first stop I think that I ever did in Europe was Portugal. And I, that was one of my favorite stops ever because it was, they were, it was a soft opening of a hotel. So basically no one was there except for people for this poker tournament. The hotel was so gorgeous and it was right on the beach, literally on the beach. And it had a pool that overlooked the beach and uh, play was starting later a lot of the time. They ended up moving things, I think, because there were some weird regulations that happened in the middle where it was like, we weren't allowed to record inside of the um, venue. So we were just having to go out and find all these other locations to record at. And they were having volleyball tournaments in the morning. And I was still not drinking at all when I was working. So I was just waking up at like six in the morning and just going to the beach. And um, it was really, really a beautiful, like a, just a really beautiful spot where I right away realized how connected all of these people were already and just how fun this was going to be. You know, what a weird, cool job this was going to be. And I'm sure that's also part of it is, you know, the first stops you just are still like a child, you know, opening your Christmas presents or whatever. It just felt super new. And I think I also felt a little bit like I've arrived, you know, this is, this is my job. I'm staying in a fancy hotel and I get to um, do, do all this cool content, you know, creating for, for work. Like what a cool job. And I do still feel like that. Um, well, speaking of first stop, Sarah, we get to enjoy this, the first EPT online. You know, 2020 has been a crazy year, and I'm really excited that uh, Poker Stars and the EPT have found a way to host this series. As we mentioned, it started on November 8th. It's going to run through the 18th. 20 million in guarantees across 20 events. There's always been already been some winners crowned. You can read those updates on Poker News. Dot com And then also it's going to culminate with a $5,200 buy-in uh, EPT online main event on November 15th. And something I'm excited about, Sarah, is now by the time this show comes out, we'll have already selected a winner. We don't know right now, but we're doing an uh, EPT for charity contest where we're going to give away a $5,200 EPT online main event seat. Um, there's a charity component asking the winner to donate 10% of their w potential winnings to a charity of their choice. People have been entering by submitting videos and I'm excited to see who wins the contest, but I'm even more excited then to have the poker news team track this player, do updates on them and to see if they can make some waves in the EPT online main event. It's uh, going to be a very exciting tournament. I wish I could play it. Uh, I can't. I'm in the U.S., unfortunately, but if you're out there, you're around the world, you want to play it, 
definitely check it out. Uh, Fifty two hundred dollars is pretty steep for some, but the good news is is that they have satellites as low as five dollars and fifty cents. So get out there and try to win your way in. Just like Kevin McPhee, guys, it's not you could satellite into every event if you really try. Just kidding, but that was kind of impressive when he said he was really satelliting into all of the different events. It's so crazy, but yeah, I think as a as a community, you know, when I think also about the fact that all of these live reporters are able to work, you know, that they're able to still maintain their lives, I just feel so blessed for for that for them. And so definitely check out the coverage on PokerNews.com. We've got to support these these people in our community and we've got to support just poker as we go through this interesting transition if you guys want to follow us at chad a holloway at anti a-u-n-t-y chardonnay please do so let us know interesting stories we should be looking into and catching up on and by the way we've got a whole nother podcast going out the very next day which will have Kristen bicknell and We've got two other interviews, which we're going to throw into there. We're going to talk a little bit about the Caribbean poker party, but you definitely want to check that out as well. So don't click away from pokernews.com, you guys. Deuces. The key to winning big is using every little bit of knowledge to your advantage. At Odds Checker, we give you the edge. Better odds, better picks, and better offers to make you a better better. Why settle for less? Quickly compare the odds at every sports book to ensure that you're getting the best price to maximize your return. Not only that, but we have experts on every sport, from hoops and football through to soccer and boxing. Our experts analyze the form and study the stats to deliver you totally free picks and parlays. OddsChecker also highlights the most lucrative welcome offers in the industry. If you're looking to open an account, then you are eligible for hundreds of dollars in totally free bets. If you're new to legal sports betting, then we're here to help, offering simple advice to understand betting guides and updates on your state's current legislative situation. Visit us at www.oddschecker.com backslash US. Odds Checker. Sports betting smarter.